Ish and the and Assam that those parts of uh, 22 districts of Assam they never had such massive floods. So we'll wait for you to come to Mumbai. They're already set to welcome you <laughs> by the entire team get together Maharashtra. Yes. Yeah. Yes, talking of Bangladesh, we too have we have two veterans here today from Bangladesh yeah. who will tell us the you know ground realities from their uh, place. I'm very very interested in Bangladesh because eventually the tributaries and the Sundarbans and uh, uh, everything is connected uh, from Kolkata towards that entire zone, the Delta area. So that forms part of the entire marine ecosystem, which comes under the Oceans for Climate Reality Project India. So we're yeah. absolutely in the right place, right time. Yes, definitely. I think, and we have yes, and I'd love to visit Sumia. Bangladesh, do the Oceans Across Exchange program, where we can, you know, jointly uh, Oceans program there as well. And they, they have a lot of talaos and uh, lakes and smaller water bodies, which actually lead up to the tributaries. I'm sure they're going to outline today. They have a unique uh, marine ecosystem. And that's something so different from India. So it's uh, globally very, very highly marked as one of the essential places on the ocean uh, agenda. Even for Portugal, Bangladesh was uh, mentioned as well. Yes, this is it's a very, I would say, a very sensitive zone as far yes. as the climate change is concerned. This region, the Sundarban yes. region, is a very, very sensitive region. So, good. I think we we'll have a good discussion. Someone has raised hands. I'm asking them to please let us know. Uh, Zarina and Nisaji, you can just write out in the chat what you want to see. Welcome, Jamil, sir. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Hi, Sumaya. Now that everybody is here and we are live on YouTube as well, let's start with the program. So welcome everybody who has joined today for celebrating the World Mangrove Day. So we'll start with the event. I'll start with introducing our moderator for the day, which is LC Ma'am. LC Mam is the founder of the Young Environmentalist Program Trust and is the National Coordinator for Oceans and Climate Reality Project India. She's also the Indian Ambassador for the Ocean Quest Global. Marine life always enthralled her and she has become a certified diver as well. And she's researching on the ocean communities and ecosystems. She has also specialized in ocean literacy and has been acting as a catalyst among student volunteers, municipality workers, and other communities living along the Mumbai coast. Though an active voice nationally and internationally on the importance of oceans, she was also invited as the United Nations Ocean Conference to speak and contribute about outlining the commitments to advance oceans action and education. We are very thankful to you, ma'am, to be present as the moderator and guiding us on mangroves today as well. I hand on the mic to you to start with the webinar today. Brilliant execution out there, Ria. Absolutely. I think we warmly welcome you to Climate Reality Project India and uh, brilliant outline and coordination and uh, beautiful panelists, uh, good uh, outstanding list. Uh, so without much further ado, um, as always, Climate Reality Project India is always at par globally, uh, you know, uh, putting down the international dates um, through webinars, through seminars and on the ground. In fact, um, the mangroves conservation is uh, not new. It's one of the pioneering uh, projects under Aditya Ji, which took place, uh, I mean, years ago. 
So it is uh, nothing new. He will reiterate and he will outline the work already done. So Climate Reality Project India has established core grounds and moving forward in the conservation of mangroves, um, not only in Sundarbans, but many other parts of India, like even Orissa. And uh, of course, we've been doing some work in Kerala as well. So that's a very important milestone for Climate Reality Project India under Mr. Aditya Bhutir. So uh, I welcome wholeheartedly um, our um, international speakers here today. Uh, it's absolutely our pleasure that uh, Climate Reality Project India welcomes you to the um, international date on the conservation of mangroves. So uh, we do have Mr. Sharif with us, a very warm, warm welcome. And we do have Sumaya with us. I'm sure she's there, I cannot see her, but uh, we have Mr. Shamin and we do have Jayant as well. And um, it's always a pleasure to have Mr. Bhavish Swami also always guiding us, outlining our uh, dates and coordinating according to our projects and calendars. I mean, I'm very, very proud to be Climate Reality Project India, uh, you know, uh, leader. And I always keep the flag flying high under the guidance of the Star Ditya so like I told you, he's, he's already been directing a lot of work in the mangrove sections, in the wetland areas, and um, no better uh, person, keynote speaker, than um, uh, Mr. Aditya himself. As you all know, of course, mangrove conservation worldwide is a day to reckon with. And um, as uh, you know, Ria said, I was invited by the United Nations at Portugal to talk uh, on the uh, first uh, plenary session, in fact, on the first day itself, on uh, how ocean literacy can um, help and enhance ocean mitigation and climate change mitigation. So it was a real privilege. I was very humbled about that. And what my outcome and takeaway from that interaction at the uh, you know, global meet was um, that we have ocean solutions for our climate change. It's the other way around. You know, ocean, of course, there's pollution and there's a lot going on with our marine biodiversity and everything. But here the tables are turned. We're looking at ocean solutions in fighting climate change. And that's where our mangroves come in. That's where our wetlands come. So that's the protection and the high standard of elevated status that the mangrove has to, uh, you know, uh, tops the charts, in fact, to fight climate change, ocean solution. And they are an integral part of the ocean, ocean solution. So uh, I will not elaborate on the scientific uh, and the on-ground work. We have our esteemed panelists, speakers, and our scientists and experts who will outline the details about this date and the work being actually done by Asia and by India. So um, uh, without further much ado, I'd like to hand over to our chief guest speaker for this evening for our World uh, Mangrove Day, Mr. Aditya Pundir. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you for a very warm welcome and also uh, giving me uh, so much of, you can say, uh, you can, I would say a moral boost to keep on doing what we are doing. <laughs> and, for, uh, and for your information, uh, we have become bigger now, like Climate Reality India has now been, has got now five more branches joining with us. Now we have uh, Climate Reality Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Bhutan and Sri Lanka also part of the Son branch. So I'm really, really happy today to have this particular event where uh, Somia, who is looking after Bangladesh, uh, she's also joining us today to address the meeting. And yes, mangroves is something, yes, I have been uh, always very fond of. And mangroves is something also, as we all know, has got a lot of significance in terms of uh, whether it's climate change, whether it is the ecosystem, and as they the common people generally. And I remember when I was a kid and we were studying biology in the class and the teacher introduced us, the one thing she used to always say was, these are the rainforest, coastal rainforests. Whatever you like in rainforest, you find so many different species. So similarly, here in the rainforest, you will find also a lot of species. Though as far as plant species, they are quite limited to around 70, 73 of them. But if you see the fauna and flora, what they support, it's a phenomenal thing. So uh, 
my love for uh, mangroves was always there and when i was working with uh, climate reality i did get a chance to visit a lot of places i've seen the sundarbans went to odisha bhitar kanika saw the mangroves out there had the chance of seeing it in the uh, the east uh, west coast also in gujarat as in mumbai and also had saw some mangroves in uh, indonesia so so yes i have been uh, seeing a lot of mangroves and uh, they all have different characteristics because as you know the way they are situated and where they are located but it is very disheartening to when i go to some of the cities and i talk to people out there especially places like mumbai and all where where they, they are not taken really in the right spirit people take it as eyesore people say oh these are jungles you should be removed you build an airport here build a something here you know so they are taken as places where things can be done uh, more about say urban development or where you make these uh, poor people who are not having who are having a difficult in settlement they are trying to settle them there so i think these are some of the things i think which is not in the right spirit and i think we should try to make uh, this these are the programs i think i really feel that we should try to raise awareness in people that mangroves are so important and they are extremely important for the systems so of course uh, people who are joined here today for this discussion are of course knowing a little bit about mangroves and their benefits so i'll not go into real details but still i would not be doing justice if i don't say that probably the single biggest a thing which mangroves does for us is it saves us from the tsunamis and saves us from these uh, tidal tides which are coming and with the coming of climate change the amount of intensity of cyclones the intensity of these uh, rough weather as i would call it those extreme weather events is increasing and here some is something where the mangroves have been trying to work as a they are working like a wall trying to protect the people living inside and they have uh, saved a lot of lives where the, the uh, if you see the mangroves have saved a lot of lives in the poor part of the world where people are staying behind the mangroves and they have saved a lot of money also to the western countries where there's a lot of economic development behind the mangroves so they have saved a lot of money in the developed world and saved a lot of lives in the developing world so mangroves so this is one of the probably one of the biggest things they are doing and of course they are doing carbon sequestering they are doing and uh, they as i said right in the beginning that biological diversity of mangroves is so good that man that mangroves uh, uh, help us in coming up uh, the people uh, i don't know the exact number but somewhere people say around 75% to, to 85 80% of the world fisheries the catch we have is somehow dependent on the mangroves so that is a kind of support the mangrove provides and probably in, in indian context if you see uh, literally we have a literally 1.86 ton per hectare production which is about and in value terms it literally is about 25% of india's produce of the if you see so that is coming from the mangrove is connected to the mangrove area so definitely it is economically very important culturally it is very important if you look at it uh, people are connected culturally uh, very closely to the mangroves if you go to the areas where they are located like uh, the, like this there's, uh, there's a devi in in the sundarbans who's worshiped on her whose name this sundarban is named so so we have so there's a lot of cultural significance of mangroves and i would say it's also part of like climate justice that the people their culture who are very close to mangroves that should be protected and unfortunately what is happening is today these mangroves are under a lot of threat climate change everybody talks about even i'll talk about that's my domain but i'll talk about it at a later time but the firstly i would like to say is that uh, we have different challenges coming to mangroves one challenge which is coming is in the cities as i just mentioned was that it is coming because of the urbanization because of being uh, encroachment happening to where the mangroves are located and it is a, a very common place where people like to throw the debris the all the construction debris if you see from the construction companies they just go and throw it in the mangroves area then of course a lot of plastics has become an issue which today lc you were today trying to remove those plastics from your zone plastics has again become such a nuisance that sometimes you go even to those interiors of the mangroves and you find those plastic bags hanging from the trees mangrove trees which is such a eyesore so yes uh, that is again one of the big problems we are facing in terms of plastics and debris and and of course then there is a encroachment as i said and one big threat which is coming now to the uh, mangroves is coming from the climate change so in the climate change what we have come and what the again the ipcc ar6 report is also very strongly talking about is 
that uh, now there's a lot of heat waves coming. Like we are used to heat waves on the land, but there are marine heat waves also. That is when the ocean has those same thing like we have on land, even the ocean suffers from those marine heat waves. And now the number of these marine heat waves is increasing incredibly, and they can grow from sometime weeks to months to as far as the length goes. And when you have these marine heat waves, they're very bad for the mangroves. They are not at all good for the mangroves. And it is expected that in case if this type of heating, if 1.5, we don't control the global climate change, at, uh, the heat increase at 1.5, and we go into that, the, the three degree level and that uh, three, 4.5 level uh, by 21st century. And in that situation, the chances of the mangroves Mangroves can cope up by till 2040. That's what the scientists of the global scientists feel. But by, but by 21 century, it will be very difficult for the mangroves to survive if, this, if the warming continues like this. So this is one very major existential threat which the mangroves might be facing in the coming times. Another thing which you see uh, as far as mangroves are concerned is the sea level rise. Now, if you see the India coast, it's very different. Like on the East coast, we have a very gentle coast. While if you go towards the west side, it's a steep coast, like in the uh, Benga, Gujarat and the Mumbai side. So what is happening is in the weather, it's a gentle coast is there in the east side. There the destruction of mangroves is happening much more because the rise in sea level is getting more and more inside the, 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 the sea levels are rising. And it is causing a lot of, uh, you can say, hydrological issues in the mangroves and mangroves are again, uh, having this existential threat because of the sea level rise in this area. So sea level rise is again going to be one major thing in coming times uh, when we are looking at mangroves. So because of the climate change. So uh, combined with climate change and now this human thing, it is going to be a very difficult journey forward. But there are some good stories also, like after the globally it has been accepted and people have understood the importance and a lot of scientists have been, we are thankful to a lot of scientists who have really been relentlessly saying that and people like Elsie who have been relentlessly talking about it to the public that do something about it so that today we are in a situation where in India if you see uh, we had about 6,000 square kilometer of mangroves way back in 1960s but if you see today it's about 4,900 or approximately so we have come down though in the uh, 80s we had fallen to 4,500 so now again we are growing so now uh, restoration in the last 30 years has been encouraging and mangroves are being restored at a lot of places in India. And so the graph has started looking up, which is an encouraging sign, but still we are far away from where we were. Like I said, around 6,000 we were, and now we have just not, we've still not reached 5,000. So there's a lot of way to go. And I think if we can go to our level of around 6,000 or so, that will be a good thing. It will be a good thing for the mangroves. It will be a good thing for the people because economically also people are dependent in the coastal region. And in terms of climate change, as we see, everything is being disturbed, whether there's a social living, whether the way they live, the way they are threatened by these things. In case if we are very able to, uh, uh, you can say, work with the mangroves and we are able to increase them, make them more fertile and make them more, it will be like a resilient strategy. It will be a resilient strategy for the coastal communities. And of course, the threats coming from the up, uphill life example, the pollution threat, as I was talking about, the pollution threat coming with the type of chemicals and minerals which are coming into the, as you said, uh, Elsie, you said about the, the East Coast having a lot of the Brahmaputra and Ganges and all these uh, the estuaries being formed and the deltas being formed. So a lot of these uh, pollution is now coming from upper, upstream down to downstream to the mangroves. So which is becoming a threat in, an, in case if we are able to solve this problem. So this will be also good for the health of the mangroves. So I am quite sure uh, because mangroves, uh, the way they are, the way and the West Bengal government, the way uh, which, which has the highest number of mangroves in the country is doing a lot of number of things. And I know the Bangladesh government is also doing a lot of work towards restoration of the mangroves. So in case I think if the, we are able to I personally feel as the last comment I would like to give as the experts out here, they will give us much more detail. The last thing I would like to say here is that I think as climate reality, as a conservation organization, as a climate change organization, it's very important that we are able to raise awareness in people about the mangroves because a lot of people still confuse mangoes and mangroves. 
So you're so there's a lot of difference between a mango and a mangrove. So this is a difference we have to tell people that mangroves, what they are, why they are important. And if we are able to generate this emotional connect among the general people, because people who are living with mangroves, they love mangroves, they know mangroves. But people even who are living in the hinterland, like I'm living in Delhi. So if we are able to understand the significance of mangroves and we get emotionally connected to them and we know how important they are, that is probably one way we will be able to ensure the survival in coming times. So thank you very much, Elsie, for uh, organizing this. I think this is a, a, I would say, a step in the right direction and wishing you all the best and I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you. Absolutely. On the spot, Aditya ji, I mean, you have really outlined with, uh, you know, uh, the connection between um, the importance of uh, mangroves here uh, in India. And I can totally relate it back to the ocean conference, which took place, which outlined, like you said, uh, the chant is now 30 under 30 means 30% of the marine ecosystem, including the mangroves and the marine biodiversity should be saved before 2030. So 2030, uh, 30 under 30 is our mission statement for at least um, this educational progress as we take forward to our next generation and our communities. Um, and like Aditya said, of course, infrastructure and coastal development are one of the, you know, a few reasons why our mangroves are being destroyed besides uh, chemical and plastic pollution. And uh, to outline again, Climate Reality Project is a conservationist group and we are into um, education. So therefore, uh, keeping in mind today World Mangrove Day, I think we'd like to um, you know, uh, enhance our capacity for our trainers and our audience, target audience as well, on the outlines of ocean literacy. If we have ocean literacy, there are very true, there are people that even till today I talk to don't know the difference between mangoes and man mangroves. Uh, they, they're not even, uh, even people from their own backyard of the oceanic states uh, do not know much of their marine biodiversity. So it is sad. So therefore, we will uh, outline uh, for this agenda the coming uh, years, uh, we will pass on the baton to the next generation through 30 under 30, hashtag 30 under 30 as well as ocean literacy. Ocean literacy in schools and colleges where scientific knowledge, traditional knowledge and ground field work and scientific knowledge are all knitted into one uh, to uh, make sure that we have the right ocean literacy passed down to the next generation to help again ocean mitigation and climate change mitigation. So absolutely on the same lines and Aditya, we are uh, so inspired that we are going to be more marching forward with these outlines and uh, without much further ado i'd like to invite our next speaker miss sumaya mamun a very warm welcome by climate reality project india and i'd like to outline that uh, sumaya was trained in 2020 at the first online global training program she's professionally an architect with practicing experience in urban sector uh, urban sector that brings us a lot for our city, uh, you know, domain. So that's a lot of exchange already there with your knowledge. And um, she has deep concern in the sector of resilience. She grew up at coastal cities and developed interest in the areas towards holistic model of resilience and nature-based solutions, indigenous knowledge, traditional land and water management system, ecology effect, and local reason of climate change and extreme weather. She has worked both as consult consultant for foreign funded development project and as an action oriented researcher, focusing on local led climate change adaptation. Her work base, uh, focuses on nature based solutions and uh, besides promoting NBS and LLA at professional field, she also conducts workshops, presentations and lectures on extreme weather and environment related both offline and online for Climate Reality Project Bangladesh. So very, very warm welcome, Sumaya. And of course, I will leave it to you to um, you know, educate. A lot of our audience here participating today are also part of the teachers, the professors, and the academia, the students, as well as our leaders and uh, you know, lay people uh, who can get inspired to have that exchange uh, of information between 
uh, Bangladesh and India where we can uh, take our uh, have our key takeaways at the end of today's session. So over to you, Sumaya. Warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Well, I would like to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Well, I wanted to start in, a, in another line, but I would like to add something in my presentation when I, when I will talk. The, and that will link to Aditya sir's comment or the concern of modern development system that is actually hampering our mangroves, not only mangroves, all kinds of natural wetlands and uh, areas that are related with water. Well, Whenever we're talking about plantation of mangroves, there is two different things. One is active delta, both are delta, mangroves are part of delta, but one is an active delta and Bangladesh is an active delta. Not only Bangladesh, total Bengal delta is an active delta. Some part of the Bengal delta falls in, in the Western, uh, at the West Bengal and some of it is in Bangladesh. A major part of it's in Bangladesh. So. The formation of Bengal Delta started with the, how do I do these things earlier? Well, this is how the Delta is working. It's not a fixed land. It's always moving. It's moving between soil and water. And this is our mighty Ponta River, which is a major source of siltation, which is carrying siltation to, to our Delta. and this is how it works. And you can see that over the years, the water is changing its paths. And how this is happening, this, this depends on the uh, quantity of siltation and quantity of rainfall. Now, as we know that hydrological cycle, whenever, whenever it's, oh, the world is getting warmer, so there will be more rain. And with more rain, there will be more soil erosion. And in our case, the Bengal case, we will have more siltation and more land formation. This is one difference that we are having from the rest of the world. So in case of Bengal Delta, what we are seeing here is Sundarban and how it grows, it's very interesting. The perennial rivers and canals have created such a network of water and land that it is, it has created a ecology of aquatic ecology. And with this, the, whenever we are saying that to protect this land, pro, to protect this soil, we need plantation of mangroves, but before mangroves, it comes the aquatic ecology. And to make this aquatic ecology, to create the appropriate one, we need flow of water. Not only flow of water, we need flow of siltation based water. If we cannot uh, have this water flow, then this uh, land will not grow. And whatever things we do, we, if we plant mangroves, we create embankments, this, we cannot hold this land anymore. Well, right now I will show up a study of a small village which is facing erosion. And this village is here as, uh, as spotted, the blue spot is that village and the name of the village is Chakma. Well, this is, what I'm showing here is the change in river course. Well, uh, I think uh, you can see my cursor. Please uh, let me know whether you can see my cursor or not. Yes, ma'am, you can see it. Okay. This, is, this, this is where the village is during 1980. Now, it's surrounded by a river. The name of the river is Kapodakko. It's very near to Shundarvan, and once it was part of Shundarvan, the core part, of, it was within the core part of Shundarvan, but uh, as we know that the British uh, rural, the British had uh, declared Shundarvan as a moon land, and because they couldn't get any tax from here and cleared the mangrove forest and make it as a uh, cultivable land for the farmers. So Chakla is one such place, which was once a part of Shundarban, but later, later in the British period, it became a village. But 
this is what is happening right now. This is the picture of 1980. It, all these pictures are collected from Lancet. And you can see that river course is changing. And with the change of river course, the land formation is changing. Now, at the second slide, this is uh, here, you can, here is uh, right now, the settlement is on the embankment. The main village has been washed away. And if you see over time, this river stream has changed a lot. And with this change, there is a gain of land. This yellow patches that I'm showing here, it's a gain of land. And with the gain of land, some mangroves are naturally being grown here and it's, it's protecting the new land. But there is a, also a loss of land. So whenever we are talking about mangrove plantation and where we are planting it, it's very important to know what the land will be forming in the next years or the coming years. And from where we will lose our land. Well, this, this is a natural phenomenon of Delta. We cannot stop this natural phenomena. Now, what has happened to this village is right now the soil of the village is totally saline and it's, uh, there is a massive soil erosion and you can see that there, it, it, was, it is not rainwater that's blocked here. The water that is blocked here because the land is below sea level. Now, how did it happen? And you can see that the homesteads are below the embankment line. This is the village. It's the satellite image of the village. And here I'm showing the profile of the village. The bigger straight line, this larger line is this one, the graph that's up here. And the short, short section is here. Now, the points, the two points that I have dot with the given dot with a purple color is the two point of embankment. Similarly, at the short section, the yellow dots are the color of embankment. Now, what happened to the other land? What we can see here is it's a bowl shape land. And how did it happen? Because throughout the Bengal part, from 1965, a coastal embankment project has been implemented and all the villages right now have embankment, protection embankment so that the tidal water, the storm surge water, then ever comes into the village. But that was the intention, but that really didn't happen. The case happened like this, as with the tide, the alluvial siltation has enriched, had enriched our soil over the years. But after the embankment, this uh, siltation couldn't happen in the village. As a result, the riverbed got risen and the village got this kind of soil erosion. Now, what is happening whenever, well, I'll talk one thing more. What is happening during storm is, the, these villages are getting flooded by storm surge and the water that has got trapped. During Isla, all these villages were trapped in water for two years. And during Isla, another thing happened that lots of mangrove trees faced and, uh, an effect of solid salt spray. And for that salt spray, we had a massive loss of mangrove trees. Well, this is the embankment that has been created right now with bags, but this embankment is on a soil. The Shundarban has a special kind of soil. This soil is not uh, very mature. And what happened is whenever the water touches this soil, this soil becomes very soft. But within three, two to three, uh, two to three hours, in, in the sun, this soil becomes dry, like this one. So this is a very special kind of soil. Whenever we are putting embankments or uh, this back embankments, even concrete embankments, and there is this little gap or a very small gap in those part or, or the perforation in the concrete uh, construction, if what this saline water can reach that kind of soil, 
the main soil on which this embankment is built, then the soil will, will be soft again. And as we are uh, observing that even our concrete embankments, they're getting washed away during cyclones. That's the reason that these embankments were built on this kind of silted soil. Well, there's another interesting thing in the picture that is, there is a natural growth of mangrove grasses. Now, if we look close this, to these grasses, these are called, I, I will address these grasses as local name. These grasses are called Thani Ghas. And it's very important for soil formation. These are the grasses which makes the soil, the, takes the salt from the soil and makes the soil less saline and prepares it for further mangrove plantation naturally. Now, if we see the layers of mangrove, layers of soil in Shundaban, this is the first layer of siltation. The siltation has just taken places. Then the second layer and the third layer of siltation, we can have, or we can see this naturally grown thani hashes, which prepared the land further. And after that, after that layer, we see orpocha, another local small species of mangrove. And it is very important that these orpochas make the soil more, uh, more mature and takes out the salinity from the soil. And after that stage, that we can, after that stage, we can see the vine, boron, shunuri, and other plants, which we plant as a mangrove trees. We only plant this layer of the top layer of trees, but whenever we are planting this top layer of trees, most of the time, the places we choose to plant this top layer of trees is the place where there should be dhani growth hush in natural sense. Now, this is a naturally grown mangrove where in the picture you can see the layering of trees. These are all dhani hushes. Then the small trees which you cannot see from here. And after that, the larger trees. This is another picture where you can see the horpucha. This, uh, this is also naturally grown. These are not man-made plantations. So uh, after that, I will show them how the man-made plantation is going on. Well, I will go, I will focus more on the roots because root are the system which is uh, which is holding the soil and which is holding uh, this uh, soft soil or immature soil that needs to be mature. So this is soil of pine tree. And if you can see, this is horizontal soil, oh, horizontal roots. At the first stage after horpocha, there needs to be horizontal roots so that the soil that is coming can stay there. And after that, if this is also root of pine tree, well, here I would like to say one thing that uh, within the last 30 to 40 years, the pine tree has an adaptation to increase saline tolerance because the saline is uh, increasing at Shundaban region and the, the roots that we can see here, the upper part, the trunk area, it was not present before 30 or 40 years before. But right now we can see these kind of roots on black pine trees. Well, another thing is after that there we'll see the vertical roots. The, the vertical roots are the roots where the uh, soil will gain height. Well, we all know that Bengal Delta has a mild slope. And in case of mangroves layering, this mild slope, the this mild slope uh, preparation is also seen for roots. Like at first the honey grass, then the small forpucha, then the horizontal root trees, and after that the particle trees. So the soil that is gaining, uh, that is we are getting here is gaining height in these cases. Well, this is uh, erosion, here erosion is happening on this, uh, on this land. What we can see is the roots are getting open. In the, If there was no erosion, then we could see the layers, but as the erosion is already happening here, the roots are getting exposed. 
when the roots are getting exposed, these trees will eventually die out. And uh, in that case, as we have, as I have shown that the river course is changing here. So it's not the only case of Chapla. The river course is changing throughout the zone of Shunwabon. And it's a natural phenomenon, it's a natural part. But as I have shown there, that the land we're losing for river course change, it's, it's less than the land we are gaining for river course change. Well, this is the same area during tidal and in dry time. Uh, this, uh, in this picture, I want to show that layering thing that at the first beginning layer, the horizontal goods will be there and after that, the vertical goods. Well, at the more inner part, the canal part, we, we can, where the tidal course is not much, then we will see the natural growth of Kulbata. Here I am uh, addressing all the trees on natural names. So, so it, this is, if we can see the root of Kolbata, then it's it's more it's it's more like it's holding water more. So the phenomena, the, because it's not holding the soil, what is it is doing is it's taking saline out or salt out from this water. So we as we move inwards, then this Kolbatas will make. Uh, the environment for more sweeter water. So we are moving now from salty water land to sweeter water land. One thing I would like to mention that as, uh, as the cultivation of prawns or, or lobsters are massively cultivated in this region, uh, this uh, these cultivators collect uh, the seeds of these prawns from river. Now, they are doing it in such a land that which is preparing or which is getting supposed to get prepared for mangroves. Now, whenever we walk or they walk on the, that land and collect that seeds of for those prawns, then the land could not get prepared. Rather, the land that was supposed to, or the soil that was supposed to be prepared for mangrove, get, get washed away or get erosion, get uh, space uh, erosion due to this kind of activity. And from where this kind of activity is going on, there the mangrove also faces severe uh, natural erosion and the roots are getting exposed, what we can see from this picture. And uh, with time, with uh, with the storm, more storm surge, this land will be getting washed away. So whenever we are trying to plant mangroves, we should mention to the local people that in that area they cannot do such things like collecting prawn seeds. Well, another thing is mangrove is uh, plantation of mangrove. Though we are planting it right now, but it's a natural phenomenon. It has been a natural phenomenon for years and. The mangroves has uh, survived an ice age before and nothing had happened to it. But how did it work? The seeds of the mangrove fall from the trees and they float around the year. And throughout the year, this germination, that germinated seed doesn't, uh, doesn't die and it can float, float thousands of miles through sea. Now, what is happening is when we are doing this massive plantation, we are collecting such seeds. All the seeds of mangrove doesn't become a mangrove tree, but those that doesn't become a mangrove tree becomes fertilizer for the soil. And when we are collecting these seeds from the soil, like it, to, to have in our mangrove nursery, then we are in a case creating barrier in sense of fertilizing the soil in a natural way which we should not do in a proper sense. So then what actually, or what actually works for the mangroves to survive is at first the siltation of album soil carried by rivers and canals, canals. then the appropriate aquatic ecology, it needs to happen there. Then floating mangrove seeds should come and the soil that is created should be created through regular tides. Now, if 
we, if we see the natural growth of mangrove, then we'll see the first layer is thorny grass. The second, this grass will make the soil more mature and remove or reduce salinity from the soil. The second layer is growth of porpoise. The third layer is horizontal root trees like pine. The fourth layer is the vertical root trees. Now, this whole system of plantation depends on the system of appropriate aquatic ecology. Well, I would like to mention here one thing uh, lining to Aditya sir, like why we are not seeing mangrove or why we are seeing mangrove as a waste of land and want to develop or want to make airports or want to make cities in those areas. Well, that uh, that is related with British fear, as I was saying that the British declared this land as a moon land for collection of tax and they made the, after, there is one, another thing I'd like to mention that after the land act that was, uh, that was that what we call is Chirostai Bondwast in Bengal, the Permanent Settlement Act. After the Permanent Settlement Act, a lot of people become landless after the declaration of that Permanent Settlement Act. And the British government has uh, had, had established those or taken those landless la people to this moon land, what they call the moon land, the Shundabal, and establish uh, villages there. And with that notion, the colonial notion of development, which is more road centric, rather the previous or our own notion of development, which was more water centric, because we, uh, in previous times, we, even if you see the religion, in our religion, in Islam or in Hindu religion, the water is a sacred thing. And we, uh, we, the, we think with water, we keep water as a sacred thing and we don't want to make this water polluted in both religion. But in British system, water is a backside of development because their development is more linked towards road. And as we, are continuing that colonial mentality in modern times in our modern development system. So due to that mentality, all these lands, which is related with water, which is related with forest from where we cannot get taxes, looks like moon land to us. There is also a language barrier, like as I'm saying every time the moon land, but in Bangla, we have meaning of moon land is not what the English meaning as uh, water, land, forest, everything falls in moon land in the English system. But in Bangla, we have Nodi, the river, the canal, the forest, and all these are together. We, we never see these things in Bengal Delta as a uh, moon land or as a land from where we cannot get any benefit. Rather, we, get, we live on these lands. So there is a, a psychological or a philosophical debate between the development of British system and or the colonial system and the traditional system of Bengal Delta. And, and in case of Shundarbon or in case of the development in Delta or the development in that perennial region, this uh, conflict of philosophy is need to be addressed because without addressing this uh, conflict, we cannot show the real development which could save our ecology, both of Shundarvan ecology and both the aquatic ecology. So Maya, that is absolutely such a well outlined, um, you know, presentation. Uh, we are running out of time, but um, it was very, very well scientifically outlined uh, the whole Bangladesh uh, scenario and what the work you're doing is brilliant and uh, we need to have uh, a whole session where you can outline and map and show us further. That was so insightful. We are so grateful. We look forward to working with you in Bangladesh together here in India as well and we will take that forward. Of course, like you said, uh, you know, there is a lot of conflict and you are working on those lines. So um, in our future coming months, uh, we will uh, sit across and see how we can have an exchange 
of ideas and concrete solutions to take it forward. That was brilliant. Thank you, Sumaya, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I'm absolutely privileged. I mean, it's a great honor to have a senior, uh, you know, veteran in working in the field of, um, you know, um, mangroves and wetlands. Someone who's globally so recognized is Mr. Sharif Jamil. A very, very warm welcome to him, ladies and gentlemen. He is known as the Buri Ganga River Keeper. Mr. Sharif Jamil is an internationally recognized leader and activist in the global environment and human rights movement. For more than two decades, he has been organizing civic action for environmental justice in Bangladesh through involvement in the country's largest civil society platform of Bangladesh called BAPA. As a member and general secretary of BAPA, Sharif Ji has worked to save the country's rivers, wetlands, forests, and green spaces. And he works in close consultancy with Waterkeeper Alliance, which started in 2009. And he has been uh, the representative, uh, uh, the regional representative. And uh, he's also been declared as the 20 Waterkeepers Warriors in the world. So it's a privilege for Climate Reality Project India to welcome you today. Mr. Sharif is also the founding member of the National Committee for Saving the Sundarbans, a coalition of over 50 organizations to protect Sundarbans reserve forests, the largest contiguous mangrove forest in the world. Who better than to have than Sharif Ji? A very big round of applause and warm welcome from India. Over Thank to you, you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm very humbled by this long introduction, but I feel more comfortable to be introduced as an environment activist. Well, hello to everyone. I can see there are a lot of attendees from different parts of the world, so it's not like evening here everywhere. So um, it's good morning, it's uh, good afternoon, good evening everywhere. Where you are. And I'm very delighted to be a part of this um, very important discussion today. It's, it's a, an international day and to learn mangrove, to um, it's, and the, the importance to protect and all these things is very important as the International Mangrove Day today. So thank you so much for having me here. I was listening from three of you, three of the deliberations, and I was so impressed. I didn't think it would go, take me that far, and I would get the opportunity to learn a lot of things, particularly from Sumaya. Um, she was so brilliantly analyzing all these things about our mangrove, and especially the active delta. So I'm, I, I'm sure I have a lot of things more to learn from her coming days. And um, before I go to my presentation, I have a presentation and I prepared it uh, with a very short span of effort, uh, but I think it would be useful for the attendees and the participants and who will be listening to and watching this thing later on from the online platforms. So I would like to have the permission to share it, share the, yes, it's given there. Thank you so much. But before I go for my presentation or whatever I could prepare the slides, listening to three of the presentations, I actually want to make some comments on these because uh, the discussions are so important and not necessarily for uh, Bangladesh or for Bengal Delta or for the Sundarbans. It's very important for all the people across the world. So I think this will be some additions to the discussions. And I will try to be very brief, limited to the allocated time. And that's why my presentation will be a bit quicker because I also want to um, put some remarks on the important points you made, all of three. Especially you started with the ocean solutions is um, uh, ocean solutions in fighting climate change. It is very important, and that's why the protection of oceans are so important in the SDGs. If you see the targets and the 
things than how they wanted to protect the from pollution, from encroachment, for uh, from many things. It it has it has a lot of issues to be concerned about from fossil fuel extractions, from shipping, from so many things. Uh, it is important, and we need to discuss this thing more uh, precisely in different platforms. Uh, another one was um, mangroves are a special creation of the nature. Uh, you, you will try to explain it from uh, different examples. But uh, I have got a chance to see um, a couple of mangroves in different parts of the world. Mangroves are actually uh, one of the very special natural creations uh, in this art or universe, whatever you say. Sundarbans is like that because Ganges and Brahmaputra are there. And Ganges and Brahmaputra are like that because the Himalayas are there. And the Himalayas is like that because it has a collision between Eurasian tectonic plate and Indian tectonic plate 50 million years back. And it created the Himalayan range. And it is very important for Sumaya also to know. I think she knows. However, I want to mention it that the uh, land subsidence in Bangladesh is not necessarily only for the obstacles we have in our transboundary rivers to get the sediments coming across. It has also another reason of this tectonic destabilization in this region. The Indian plate is always uh, pushing the Eurasian plate. And that's why on an average, Bangladesh is getting subsidence from land across annually. Some places in the Dauki Fault in the coalition place, it is more than that. So land formation of this active delta is very important, which is being obstructed significantly by the transboundary obstacles at the upstream, uh, especially for the Sundarbans. Ganges is very much obstructed by many barrages and hydroelectric projects at the upstream in India and Nepal. So uh, the mangrove is, uh, Sundarbans mangrove is getting different uh, problems, multiple problems as Sundarman's mangrove is also different than other mangroves in the world. And that's why it's, uh, it's World Heritage Site and all other things. Uh, if you see Mississippi Delta created mangroves, the many del I mean, Rhine Delta created mangroves, and Ganges Delta created Sundarman's. So Sundarman's is very important. Another one, uh, very important thing that I came to uh, land, which is water-centric development, land-centric development. This is really amazing how she brought this philosophical and really reality, historical thing. If you go to the minutes of uh, British Parliament, you will see when the rail tracks were developed in this region, there was a debate in the British Parliament. A bunch of uh, parliamentarians was uh, in favor of developing the uh, river navigation and transportation systems here, but the railway supporters won the voting because, uh, and it was uh, pointed out by uh, some parliamentarians in British Parliament that yes, you want to bring the, extract the resources and bring it quicker to us, and that's why you are developing railway, but uh, that nation will suffer after hundreds of years when this navigational network will be distracted. And uh, she mentioned about 1965 initiation of um, coldering our coast, but it started from 1952 and 53 when there was big flood and the then Pakistan government requested American government to give the suggestion and Krug Commission was formed. And that Krug Commission actually suggested this uh, cordon approach or commercial approach and blocking the uh, waters to go to the pl flat plains and foreshores and canals and river bridge networks and inundate our farmland and put the seals onto the uh, farmlands. So you are right. It's very right. I'm very impressed by listening to this. Anyway, let me go to the presentation and try to quickly finish it. So today, uh, I will not be um, uh, trying to waste time with 
all the positive things happening with the mangroves. Of course, there are so many positive things going on from the state level to social level or to people's level. And one of the one of those examples are the discussion today itself. So I'm not going to praise all these things. I will try to underscore a little bit of importance that you already discussed. So I'll be very brief there. And then to let you get some idea about the threats of this mangrove. So this is what my endeavor will be today. Well, you know, you heard from Sumaya already about the Sundarbans. It's actually currently a 10,000 square kilometer of uh, single track mangrove. And only the four footed animal can go to this uh, area, you know, because of the uh, characteristic of the Sundarbans and mangroves. And Ganges and Brahmaputra created it. And 6,000 square kilometer of it is in Bangladesh and 40% is in India. So uh, it's very important to understand that uh, she tried to mention and she showed the map about the navigational network. But it's like a network of more than 5,000 canals and rivers. It's not an, only a land and forest, it's 1,800 kilometer of waterway. So it's very important to understand the significance of the Sundarbans. I don't like to take more time to explain why Sundarbans is so rich and so important, but it's been, it's been analyzed well enough to declare Sundarbans as a Ramsar site, Sundarbans as a world heritage site. So global community and scientists already recognized Sundarbans as a very special and different mangrove in the world. It's like a lot of the diversity it has. I drove from Mobile, Alabama to New Orleans over the Mississippi Delta mangrove. So I saw uh, other mangroves also. I have been to um, Rhine Delta many a times, but Sundarbans is so diverse and so unique. If you go deep into the Sundarbans uh, in terms of gathering knowledge and diversity of the Sundarbans, it is believed that it is still unexplored. So Sundarbans is not fully explored yet. Only a few years back, one Adam Barlow, a friend from you, in England came, uh, worked together with the London Zoological Society and did some study on Bengal tigers. But it has a lot of things yet to know about the Sundarbans. So, but you know, Bangladesh is a very densely populated country. We have like more than 1,200 people, I believe now, in one square kilometer. It is very densely populated country, and the extreme weather patterns you said from the Indian Ocean to West Bay of Bengal are more recurrent these days. And there are there are studies, and it showed like those cyclones are these days more intense than the previous days. So the devastation and the the the, the, the destructions are so enormous. And of course, she rightly pointed out about Isla. The water was there um, for two years. We did a press conference just four days ago together with some organizations from the coast of the Bay of Bengal in Bangladesh. And now the normal um, high tide actually are entering into the village area in Koira, in Dako. They requested me to go and I'm planning to go in the next couple of days actually. So the things are very bad and the, the poldering and the the obstacle and uh, the uh, dividation between the sea and the uh, delta are so uh, unscientific. And so it's not, I, Netherlands is now thinking to move their cities to the east. I've been to Amsterdam two months ago. And uh, it, it is proven that it's not possible to exist. And, uh, I mean, like fight between the nature and uh, civilization. It will create an existential question one day. And that's why the Western embankment in Dhaka is creating so much water looking here. And that's why our prime minister did not allow the Eastern bypass to be an embankment. He, she said it should be an elevated expressway. So this is what we need to understand. But unfortunately, the Delta Plan 2100 said so many good things. But inside the Delta Plan 2100, all the projects are coming from uh, before the formation of the Delta Plan 2100, and they are all cordon and commercial, they're poldering mode. So, well, I don't want to go to that discussion, but it's itself a big disaster. It's like philosophical, um, our mindset or the understanding 
uh, about our delta, our existence, our development needs to be rethought. And it's, it's really very, um, we are ending up our time. So we need to understand the things. However, when this government formed in 2008 and 9, they envisioned, they envisioned the long-term development of the country's economy. And of course, we have a lot of people who need food for them. We need development. People are actually, as I said, if you can utilize the resource in a proper way, so we have here enormous potential. It's a big market itself. So yes, a government rightly choose the priority to grow the economy of the country. And they also decided there is some uh, philosoph there is the philosophical question came. Like when you want to grow your economy, how will you grow it? You go went for industrialization, but what kind of industries you are inviting? That's the question. So in 2010, government formed Special Economy Zones Authority to attract investments from the other nations and multinational corporations or corporate bodies to invest and um, let them get a suitable and good, um, um, good area or land assigned zones for them to invest. And government declared more than 100 special economic zones across the country. So those industrialization, uh, no matter what kind of, whether they're clean, green, agriculture-based, historical analysis are there or not, but those industrializations actually need other infrastructures and raw materials to grow. So the government also came up with, and you know, the power is, and electricity is the, um, is the very strategic, very, um, very initial, uh, raw material for uh, for economic growth by industrialization. So government in 2010 formed a power system master plan. So uh, unfortunately, after 50 years of independence, we should have formed our policy ourselves and national friends. But unfortunately, this policy was um, uh, contracted by Zaika to TEPCO to form it. TEPCO is Tokyo um, uh, Electric Power Company. So Zaika contracted TEPCO to form our power system master plan and they formed it in 2010. And then we came to know the Sundarbans in trouble because we, we actually, our focus is on 46% forest itself is only Sundarbans. And Sundarbans is so special because it protects the entire southern part of the country from extreme weather patterns and calamity and disasters. A lot of people would die by cedar and ally if there was everyone, I'm fun, whatever you say. Our father of nation in the early 70s said, if we cannot protect the Sundarbans, the erosion that will start from the sea will actually come uh, across the middle part of the country. It will take away uh, Kumilla, uh, let alone his own district and the southern other districts. So it's not like a new thing for understanding, but we were protecting, protecting our environment to protect the people and to protect the country because it's so much dependent on the nature. So we found that Sundarbans is in trouble from this uh, power system master plan. <laughs> plan was actually identifying or recommending some power hubs. Of course, power cannot be produced in one place and it should be distributed in different places across the industrialization uh, that was predicted to be. So we found three major hubs in the coast and all of them are based on coal-based power. When the entire globe is coming out from coal, they recommended it to be coal from 2.5% total share be then, it envisioned like more than 50% to be from coal. So, uh, and very close proximity of the Sundarbans. So we, we got like, what, what is happening? So we actually tried to understand it. We organized a two-day conference on uh, coal energy in Bangladesh, impact on water and climate in Brazil. It was an international conference to know what coal technology is and how much impact it can have on the Sundarbans with that proximity, they are thinking about those hubs and all other things. So we tried to understand when we found it is absolutely unacceptable for those power hubs, some of those power hubs, especially the Rampal power hubs, 
to be there. And you can Google and know more about this. I will not go much deep into the discussions and debating issues. Just I want to give you a feel that how far it is from the proximity of the mangrove itself. Mangrove is Sundarbans is so much compact biodiversity and ecosystem. It's like the, uh, the, the pollination comes from the butterflies and the life of very small insects and uh, cytoplankton, zooplankton in Poshu River is important for the existence of the Bengal tiger. And if you see the Rampal hub, where the Rampal power plant is right across the Poshu River, there was a tiger attacked in a village in 2012. So it's tiger territory, it's not your territory. So we tried to understand what is happening. So we found that an environmental impact assessment uh, done by CEGIS, with, uh, not, they don't say the government institution, but by the governing bodies, you can see the secretary for the Ministry of Water Resources is by default, by position, the chair of the board of trustee. So we don't think it's an independent organization. They did a very faulty EIA. And the EIA was passed by the Department of Environment after three times rejection. They uh, passed it with 59 conditions to meet. But we that is what the uh, our involvement came to the Sundarbans. And then we tried to understand more. And there was a fact-finding mission from South Asians for Human Rights. It's a Colombo-based organization, and I was also one of the five mission members there. So I get to learn a lot about it. And then we started protesting it. And when we initially protested uh, the development of those coal plant, coal-based power hubs, uh, they, the, the criticism was like, well, environmental activists are emotional, and, and they don't talk about science much. And there are a lot many coal plants across the globe in many places where there is no harm. So we did scientific analysis. We requested globally renowned scientists to do selenium uh, modeling, mercury modeling, SOX modeling, NOx modeling from the tender document of the Sundarbans for Rampal power plant. And they came up with the recommendations and findings. And we handed it over to the government to check it and to come with their um, rebuttals. So whatever they have uh, to say that it would not do harm. We didn't listen to it, but one thing happened, which is uh, the initial plan of Rampal Hub was to produce around 6,000 megawatt. I will show it to you later, but uh, they are now stick to 1,320 megawatt. So, well, uh, we also was watching the, it's a World Heritage site. So World Heritage Committee also was worried about the outstanding universal value of the property. And they actually came up with recommendations in Krakow in 2017 to stop construction of any large scale infrastructure unless government is doing a strategic environmental assessment for Southwest region of the country. Because it is important to understand one industry, how it would be, but at the same, that will be ensured by the EIA, environmental impact assessment. But at the very hard. There are so many institutions and industries are coming up. Power, power plant does not come alone. So it comes with a lot of industries also. So we also need to assess whether the industrialization itself is sustainable or not. So UNESCO recommended Bangladesh government to do strategic environmental assessment. Well, and to request it not to go to uh, further construction of large scale infrastructure, uh, unless they are doing SEA, but the government did not listen to it for Rampal power plant. There's time lapse um, Google images. You can see how the construction was going on and how the plant was being developed. But um, th this slide is very important for uh, all of us to understand that Rampal hub is not merely the threat. Um, because there is another one, big hub. I show three major hubs in the coast, which is very to the Sundarbans in the east. This is also true, as Sumaya was saying, the Sundarbans was all across the mangrove. I mean, like the coast of the Bay of Bengal. There was Chakoria Sundarbans. Chakoria is in Chittagong, in Cox's Bazaar. So it's like mangrove was everywhere, but we chopped it down, we did different things, and that's why it's been destroyed. But there is another power hub, which is coming in Potuakali and Borguna. We call it Paira Hub, which is larger than that, like 9,000 megawatt of electricity from coal was supposed to be coming 
from there, according to the 2010 plan. Government review, we did in 2016, the power system. And later in 2021, government canceled 10 coal plants. And now the power system master plan is again under revision. Unfortunately, it is also uh, given um, responsibility to um, uh, Zaika's funding. And the consultant is like uh, uh, Institute of Energy Economics, Japan. And they are now coming up with integrated energy and power master plan. And uh, by the way, I was attending the second stakeholder meeting and the uh, focus group discussion is a frustration. It's like, uh, I don't want to discuss about this here, but the problem is the Sundarban is attacked from two, two sides, from Rampal and another one from Paira. And there are details you can Google and you can learn on these things. But the important thing is the 44th session that took place um, virtually because of the, I'm sorry, I'm going longer, but I will try to finish it quickly. So uh, then uh, the, the World Heritage Committee again come up with, they reiterated their request not to go for large scale infrastructure, do the SEA and all these things. And government took initiative to do the SEA and they uh, placed the SEA in front of the people in September, 2021. And there was 20 days time for comment on this. And we found that has no scientific integrity that actually was allowing all these industrializations and they tried to avoid all these questions. They did not discuss about any SOX analysis, NOX analysis. Um, they did not discuss about all the dirty industries coming on across those region. And they, more important, there were so many things I listed here. You can Google, you can find our online petition, our petition, our letters to the government and the CJS are all published online. So you can find all these things. The, 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 the bottom line is the SEA is going to be a scientific and technical document for many people, including the development partners, and a guideline for the environment across that region. But the SEA does not have any scientific integrity. If you see this slide, you can see how close the proximity is from the Sundarbans. It's only 20 kilometers, 19.5 kilometers away, there is a coal plant coming up. But to avoid the impact of this thing, they actually did not consider this part as the southwest part of the country. You see the territory they determined, they actually cut down the ecological critical area from their assessment as well. They failed to assess what it can happen from 20 kilometers away, but they tried to discuss about one plant in the west, 150 kilometers away in West Bengal. So it is completely unacceptable SEA has been done. So threats to the Sundarbans are many. There is uh, brackish water is coming up, salinity intrusion is coming up, Farakka is blocking our natural system in the Padda and um, Ganges River system. So this is uh, salinity intrusion in the Sundarbans is 40% uh, for, uh, double in last 40 years. And Sumaya was also saying there was there are poaching. There is bad governance in our protection system. As for example, the forest department is taking care of it. They don't have the capacity itself, and also they don't want to do that. So this is there, and um, there are other other problems also. You know, like they put poison to get more fishes from the canals when the high tide goes to the low tide, as they can catch all the fishes. They are dead inside. So there will not, you will not find birds in the Sundarbans because birds are all dead by these poisoned uh, small fishes in the canals. So there are many threats to the Sundarbans, but to us, it is the most important threat is the mindset of the policy and the development partners. India should understand that merely they cannot save their Sundarbans if they do not save the Sundarbans in Bangladesh. It cannot be protected isolatedly. And also the development partners should understand that Bangladesh needs to grow its economy through sustainable power production. So I will stop here saying that the SEA should be done properly and global community should come honestly to protect the humanity, not to protect the Sundarbans. If we cannot protect the Sundarbans, it will bring a big, big catastrophe for 
everybody, not from climate change. It will not be waiting for that day. We are already in trouble from ourselves. So we need to change our mindset. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Sharif. That was absolutely expansive. And to all our listeners and participants, you must have seen the expanse, gigantic expanse of work that he's put in there. And he's also showing you how much of work is still required. And you must have been inspired by the challenges he's faced over the two decades and how he is uh, you know, leading to the solutions. And you can see the different areas which he's outlined of his challenges and his solutions and his march forward. So I hope all our participants and our listeners will get inspired and take on his methods of how to move forward. I mean, uh, Bangladesh is on the global map of the largest areas of the sequencing, the carbon sequencing uh, zones. And uh, he has, he's a true uh, mangrove warrior absolutely to the core and we are really really thank you thank you so much mr Shiv. so uh without much further ado we also have another veteran mr shamim arfin we warmly welcome you from climate reality project india shamim sir is working as a social development activist in the fields of mangrove ecosystem protection climate change adaptation and mitigation eco-friendly agriculture, WASH, human rights to bring positive changes in the lives of occupationally marginalized community people of Bangladesh. He is one of the founding members and executive director of AOSED, an organization for socioeconomic development since 1999. So we warmly welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for finding the time to celebrate and to expound on world conservation of mangroves. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Varys, and uh, thank you, our previous uh, discussion. Actually, now I am a little bit uh, worried. There is three things. First one, uh, I am, my background is not uh, ecology or science-based. Second one, my mother tongue is Bangla. Third one, lot of information already has been shared by the earlier for four uh, discussers. They, but uh, I would like to uh, go out of box. I have a small presentation, uh, but I would like uh, say if I go to the presentation, it will be repeat again and again things. So I, I would like to go to out of the box. That's why my discussion will be not a synchronized. It will be a little bit uh, discarded. <laughs> so sorry uh, for that. Uh, uh, at first, I'd like to say uh, my discussion was it's uh, ecology. Yes, ecology. Uh, all over the world, uh, we know 118 country have the mangrove forest and uh, only Asia have 41% mangrove forest, 41 to 2% mangrove forest. And luckily, Bangladesh and the previous Bangladesh and India jointly, single largest mangrove forest is Shundarbon. And this Shundarbon mangrove forest is very, very different in other mangrove forests because there is a lot of uh, flora and fauna besides and uh, uh, about this biodiversity. We know it's uh, all of the tidal land and it was depend on the, this uh, Bangladeshi Sundarbon. Earlier, we talked about the two uh, Bangladeshi peoples here. Uh, this, uh, this is three part. It's, uh, one part is uh, uh, actually Sundarbon site was before that is not slime area. That was absolutely blackish area. Now so it's become a, a three part. It's a uh, upper part in the uh, uh, eastern part is now is more slime. Moderate part is uh, moderate slime. And uh, our uh, waste part is uh, uh, less line. This is the problem at this moment for the ecosystem. It's a totally water driven, water centered ecosystem because uh, there is uh, a lot of things. Uh, earlier, we also uh, uh, talked about this. Uh, this is young delta. Yes, it's active delta as well as young delta. Till now, this uh, the land reformation is have not completed. It's said that 
geologist. I'm not an expert, but I talk about the geologists. They also say that we need more 800 to 100,000 year, years for the human settlement. But early we had already human settlement here. Second one, Sundarbon is a very, very young or not only baby mangrove. Only 250 years, the Sundarbon age. Only 250 years. So we already, already we uh, struck the Sundarbon uh, from 2000, uh, 1959. We established a new sprint mill in Kulna city area based in the Sundarbon asset, like as uh, Sundarbon timber, uh, is especially the Kaura and Dhundol. We strike this, uh, uh, cut this uh, um, tree and for the uh, making the new spring. That was first time for uh, the Shundar, destroy the Shundarbon. When Shundarbon was a very baby or child. Second one, uh, we established a, a port, Mongla port. That was 1950. That was another problem for the Shundarbon. Uh, this, is, this was 1950. We need to recall this type of uh, 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 big uh, name of the development or the big uh, settlement which uh, are destroying our stagnant, created a lot of stagnant for the uh, grow of the Sundarbon mangrove forest. And, uh, and another thing, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, 2019, uh, 1916 decade, 16 decade last centuries, we also established a coastal embankment. That was another big problem which created on this southeast coastal region of Bangladesh for uh, the destroy this real ecosystem because this is tidal ecosystem. When we uh, construct the embankment, that time the mainland the before the uh, Shundarbo is a tidal land when the uh, high tide, the water being a lot of sediment, sediment. And when the sediment uh, uh, deposit in the, our mainland, after when we uh, stop uh, this uh, uh, embankment, this, uh, uh, that uh, high tide and all tide, they are the sediment in the river bed. That's why day by day river bed is increasing and silting. That was another big problem for the Sundarbon ecosystem. At the same time, we also talk about this previously. So I would like to escape this discussion. The upper steam, that was a very, very big question for us because our 52 main rivers became uh, from our neighboring countries, especially India and Myanmar. So we are now facing a lot of problems for the water distributing and which created another problem. And fourth on that was the slime increasing the salinity due to uh, in 18 decade uh, we also uh, um, start the commercial scene especially the um, slime water scene that was uh, uh, that created a lot of problem in, in intensity and increasing the salinity in water and soil and that's why it is creating another problem in this uh, ecosystem as well as the Sundarbon. so we need to consider this type of, at the same time, the last uh, two or three decades, we also studying again, lot of name of the development, unnecessary human intervention in the Sundarbon area. There is two di different discussion, buffer zone and impact zone. And buffer zone, it is especially the ecological critical zone. So it's a 20, 10 kilometer uh, uh, the critical zone up, upper hand, uh, other hand, this impact zone is why is the Sundarbon on, uh, before was a uh, Sundarbon uh, directly, indirectly livelihood are uh, involved in this people, that is the impact zone. So there is a lot of uh, confusion in the policy gap. That's why this creating lot of problem is there. Before that, uh, more or less, uh, uh, 50 species animal also in a 50, 65 um, uh, species animal also in the Sundarbon now become their most of the danger. And 300 species of bird now become very smaller. Besides, there is a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, species we also lost, especially the fish. Uh, every year, Sundarbon fall the leaves before uh, that was 330, 35 million ton uh, leaves. They also, uh, uh, they, they, they also leaves in the river and the canal of the Sundarbon area and they created a natural uh, fish feed for the fish. That's why the, that there was a very good in, in, in a natural environment for the uh, fish feeding and, and the fish, breed, fish breeding area, natural area. Now that also uh, day by day, they also shorter and uh, uh, more uh, problematic at this moment. At the same time, we also facing another problem due to Sundarbon, because before that, in our this region, mainly people use the house building materials which, which we, uh, they collect from the Sundarbon. Like as uh, earlier, we also talked about this, the uh, Golpata is the uh, Napapam, uh, our uh, Sundari uh, tree, our uh, another, another lot of trees, and our firewood also coming there. Uh, but now it's day by day it's increasing. Firewood is increasing. Uh, 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 this is another thing. But by house building materials now we need to use the another uh, like as the uh, 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 bricks and others uh, which is not appropriate for this region because earlier we also talk about this this land reformation till now is ongoing process but we settlement earlier that's why when we uh, house building materials use is outside this uh, like as bricks and uh, uh, tin and others uh, 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 gi sheet that created a lot of problem because this area from the very beginning it's a uh, disaster prone area so when you're facing the disaster, before that, when we use this uh, local or Sundarbon uh, uh, house building materials, there is less uh, death rate and less problem. Uh, but now we use the bricks and uh, GI sheet and others, uh, 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 the material, house building materials, they create a lot of problems. At the same time, every year, this uh, main line uh, 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 subsidize uh, more or less two um, uh, two millimeter, it's depend on area to area because there is a four, uh, two, three of the part we also talk about this. And finally, there is another problem is that our fresh water reservoir. Already we uh, uh, destroy our all fresh water reservoir in this uh, area because that was the brackish water reason. Now it's uh, they, uh, more uh, due to uh, human intervention. At the same time, the adverse impact of the climate change, the jointly, this created a lot of problem for the human. And the last one, I would like to say, this is the very critical the livelihood. Before that, lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, occupation has been developed for depend on the natural uh, resources collect from this region, like as fishermen, uh, woodcutter, is, we say bawali, honey collector, Mawali and others, a lot of things uh, they also, and uh, uh, back to back, there they are there they are a lot of uh, occupation also there. But at this moment, due to climate change and reduce the Shundarbom uh, uh, that ecosystem, lost their ecosystem, we less of fish, less of house building materials, less of honey, less of not only this asset, we main our loss is the Sundarbon once upon a time, till now also, but once upon a time, Sundarbon playing key role for save the old Southwest coastal region and the mid area, uh, the cyclone uh, from the people. Now, day by day, Sundarbon become more, more shorter. I uh, would like uh, just uh, one example, that was the CDOT 2007. That time, Shundur, Sundarbon was uh, protect this big uh, cyclone, uh, but a lot of loss there. But uh, that time, fortunately, uh, that caretaker government said that no need to go Sundarbon, no touch, no rehabilitation, no need anything. Sundarbon will revive again on his own capacity. After the five years, we saw that it's real. Sundarbon become again uh, his own uh, characters. 
But when the human intervention, name of the development, the buffer zone or impact zone, whatsoever. This is a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, debate, a lot of different opinion, but I am not an ex expert. I am the grassroots activist, but I feel that now we are day by day becoming more uh, threatened, more threatened due to climate change, more threatened due to our river, it's silted, more threatened due to our upstream uh, uh, fresh water, uh, our uh, loose, more threatened because our tidal land is not uh, properly acting tight. And oh, most of the time we're facing a lot of uh, uh, cyclone and sea depression. That's why the fish are facing a lot of problem. So this is the very closely related the ecosystem and human. Human being is a part of the ecosystem. So this is not possible to divide the human uh, and ecosystem. Human and all things are the part of the ecosystem. That's why we, uh, we personally, I believe that uh, this is the human being a part of the ecosystem. That's why we need to consider each other. But if, if we, we have not previously considered the uh, name of the development, but I think this is the right time to say right time for is to uh, action just now, where it is the, uh, due to climate change and other things. Uh, fortunately, at this moment, our uh, present government, especially our uh, honorable prime minister, personally, he is the very concerned about the, our environment, about the uh, concern our, our ecology, about the concern uh, our uh, surface water, which is the very essential for our future uh, human being, at the same time to protect our ecosystem. Because this Delta till now is young Delta not this, not a um, uh, older delta. So we have our, we are in danger position. This is the reality. So we need to work together. That's why we thanks to uh, the Climate Reality Project and thanks all of our, our, our viewers who are uh, uh, enjoying this uh, discussion and uh, discusser and especially the moderator. Thank you, everybody. Vishon Bhalu, sir, dhanyavad. Absolutely delighted that uh, you know you have transcended through all the areas and right down to the common man. Uh, absolutely uh, well outlined there that the human settlements and uh, the biodiversity is also absolutely in one connected to the human uh, kind, and that's how we have to work in tandem. So, from a common man's point of view, it gives us more courage to take on uh, your challenges and your examples uh, leading. And like you beautifully put it, it's beautiful that you have outlined that nature grows back. You know, nature, the mangroves grow back like in five years, you said, they do regenerate themselves. It is us humans who need to curb our, you know, um, a, a negative association with the marine ecosystem, with the uh, nature's biodiversity. So that was very, very insightful, Vishon Halo. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, without much further ado, um, thank you so much, all our participants here today for being so patient and for joining us. As you can see, the um, webinar is so intense, so expansive, and it is just not touch and go. The topics are very in-depth, very well outlined, and it is very some are very scientific in nature. Some de dealt on humanity and some dealt on the biodiversity expanse. This brings us a huge wealth of knowledge for us as India when we want to pass down to the next generation and what we want to scientifically uh, take away from our speakers today uh, who dived very, very deeply into all that is happening in Bangladesh. So I'm sure all our participants are highly uh, educated, informed and rearing to go also with their inspiration. So without much further ado, we do have another speaker who is not able to make it. I will make a call out for you. He is out in the field in Sri Lanka, uh, outdoors. So I don't know if he has enough network, but this is a call out for Mr. Jayanta. Mr. Jayanta is a climate champion, a branding professional come marketing expert turned conservationist for over 12 years in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia working on climate change, environmental policy, planning, conservation strategy planning, ecosystem restoration. He has worked extensively with a five-year research program in Borneo, 
that was supported by the Royal Society of UK. He's also the convener of Rainforest Protectors of Sri Lanka, uh, chief coordinator of Rainforest Protectors Trust and advisor to many local and district level environment organizations. So uh, he has uh, unfortunately not been able to make it and it is uh, way beyond nine o'clock. I am in total gratitude to the uh, you know participants here today and to our panelists to all our panelists and we thank uh, the Climate Reality Project team, Ria, Bhavesh, and of course our uh, chief, Mr. Aditya Pundin. And uh, we look forward to taking it, uh, like we said, ocean action is climate action. So this uh, webinar today was conducted for that mission that ocean action is climate action and the way forward that you have seen from our veterans, our expert panelists here today. We are absolutely indebted. And of course, Mr. Um, you know, uh, Jayanta still has not uh, been able to uh, come out of his field work and his network issues. So um, uh, we will call it, um, you know, a closing uh, um, thank you and gratitude for all of you being here today. And I, on a closing note, I would like to say that uh, having been uh, the national coordinator for oceans for Climate Reality Project India, I'm proud that we have, have had such a solid exchange of information and we'd like to take this on ground. We'd like to have an exchange program where we can learn from each other on ground as well. So it will be lovely to have an exchange program. And uh, as a Climate Reality Project, um, I'm focusing on education climate education, as well as now on ocean literacy. So we are outlining ocean literacy and the two key takeaways that I did get from the United Nations uh, conference that I will share here at the closing note is that you need, we need to coordinate and work with the government. We need to coordinate and work with the system to help them absorb climate education, environment education and ocean literacy into the curriculum. So for all of us community leaders here, whether you're scientists or community people or students, you know, we need to uh, hand over an intact planet for the next generation. So this can be done if scientific knowledge, community knowledge, social work can be handed down through ocean literacy, through climate change. So vouch for that, you know, and uh, target your uh, agenda, your annual agenda towards coordinating, uh, opening doors of conversation with the government, with your district, with your municipality, and your local schools of how you can help them absorb ocean literacy. Uh, that's where directly mangrove uh, mitigation comes in. So that's one takeaway. And on a closing note, our mission, of course, today on this beautiful day will be a reminder uh, as the United Nations and the ocean's decade, uh, 10 years has said, that um, in 2030, 30% is our target to save the marine ecosystem. So let us as Climate Reality Project leaders take on that mission. And having said that, and uh, with that thought, I'll leave you and thank you and goodbye to each and every one of you. Thank you for staying uh, right till over past nine. And it is absolutely- also, uh, uh, There's a quick Q&A session. So we have a lot of flooding questions coming from- Yes, Ria and Bhavesh, I'll hand that over to you. You could take over. Sure, sure. So uh, the panelists, the first question that comes from Mr. Nasir, the question is what a normal person can do for mangrove protection from his end? What can we do? So if anybody is ready to take up that question for Mr. Nasir, the floor is yours. Mr. Shamim? From a, uh, would you like to take that uh, from what a common a man's normal, point of what view? What a common man can do to protect mangroves? What can we do? For, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very, very important question, and it is a very uh, uh, big role of the community people as well as the government. At first, we need to. Uh, in, I, I, I talk about the, our context. Mind it, okay? Uh, this is we need to. Our our law is very old, so we need to reform the law. And we need to consider the, again in the development aspect. We need, most of the case, the development thing is breeze, culvert, and et cetera, et cetera. But we need a human development. We need to our uh, ecosystem repair that could be helpful uh, for protect the uh, 
uh, mangrove because mangrove is not possible. Some NGOs in Bangladesh, I don't mention this name, some NGOs in Bangladesh, my organization also, we also try to earlier, mangrove is not possible to replantation. We need to regenerate. That's why we need to support the community people in the nearby the uh, impact zone. Then the community people have trained themselves for how to help to nature for restoration of the mangrove. No need to plantation. This is not possible. It's possible only for laboratory. Like a school university, there is mangrove uh, plantation. But some in my organization also earlier, that was 2006, 2007, we also tried to mangrove uh, plantation. But uh, the result is that this is not possible because in generally 30 to 50, yeah, 30 to 50 yards, the mangrove uh, species has been changed their own area. This is the natural, uh, nature also decided which area will be Shundori, which area will be Goran, which area will be uh, uh, a palm tree, uh, Nipa palm and others also. That's why we need to consider at first name of the development, all activities as early as possible, we need to stop. Second one, we need to consider the, our tidal uh, system because this mangrove depend on the tidal wetland. That's why our tidal, high tide and low tide, that was the before the fourth time, now is the tidal system is a very slower. So we need to ensure the, our uh, tide system. That could be helpful for the mangrove, the restoration again. And last and third one, we need to change again our thinking pattern. What is the real development? So uh, this is the very earlier you talked about this. When we reform, when we uh, um, this new uh, new uh, generate the new uh, law, we need to consider uh, the local people, local context, local environment, and ecology, not only profit. Thank you so much, Samin sir. We have one more question, Ria. Yes, the question is of the total population of the total plantation, especially the new ones that we do. Almost half of it is washed away. So how do we protect it in terms of scientific knowledge that we can do or any local knowledge that you all are having? What can we do for that? So Maya, are you there? Am I audible? I'm here. Yes, you are. Did you get the question? Yes, I All right. Yes. I have heard it. Well, at first, plantation of mangrove uh, that, that I have shown earlier that the places that we are choosing. Whether we are planting mangroves or other trees, we are not considering the river course there. We are planting mangroves at Delta. So at first we have to consider the river course, how it is working throughout the area. Other than that, we will see lots, lots of uh, islands that is growing the, uh, at the area of Shundarvan, but those islands are not permanent. All those islands are temporary. Some are tidal islands, some uh, get submerged during the tidal waves, not in high tidal waves, in regular tidal waves, and some are permanent land. And whenever we're choosing our land for mangrove plantation, we have to keep in mind that those lands should have to be permanent. Like I've shown you earlier that Thani Ghas, those grasses, whenever we see those grasses, then we can plant those mangrove trees there. Without uh, observing the grass or uh, the growth of grass or the river course, we cannot plant mangroves and expect that it will grow. So at first we need to understand the river course, the waterway, how it is working, how the siltation is working. Then we have to choose our land. And after those considerations, we can expect that the mangroves will grow. And even though it cannot, we cannot uh, like give hundred percent guarantee that mangroves will grow afterwards after taking such consideration because there is other things the uh, the bacteria that grows in the land the appropriate aquatic culture that needs to be present in the water and the mostly the poisonous pollution poison or pollution if if that is present there we cannot expect mangroves to grow. 
that is beautifully outlined absolutely to the point by point and from climate reality project india you will find us on youtube please subscribe and you will see the video uh, for you know all the details there have been so many questions it's not possible to answer them all tonight our apologies but you will see it on youtube channel and she has very beautifully talked about this grass which is holding on for uh, soil erosion and the basic scientific outlines of her answer to this question as well you will also find climate reality project india on instagram and facebook please subscribe like and um, yeah, interact and you want to join us and spread the good word and ria do we have a time for uh, one more question just or one it's last your call question. just one last question so this is for all the city people so can the city lakes and estuaries also considered mangroves is if yes how do we consider their protection from our end for the city uh, lakes and estuaries Yes, uh, Mr. Sharif, would you like to take that, sir? Does it? It belongs to the marine ecosystem, the lakes, but does it come under the mangrove wetlands? Is that your question, Ria? Yes. If yes, yes. then how do we protect it? Well, I'm not pretty sure I understand the question well. Uh, can you please again, Ms. Ria? Uh, for all the city lakes that's there. is that considered as mangrove if yes then how can we protect it well um, of course the, if the if the uh, if the generation comes from the nature then it's mangrove but the problem is every mangrove uh, ecosystem has its own characteristic and the sundarbans mangrove characteristic is depending on largely from the himalayas to the bay of bengal because ganges is like that i was trying to point it out and over the course of time after the commissioning of farakka barrage uh, the salinity intrusion in the sundarbans is doubled in last 40 years so the brackish water the water where it was mingled before is actually getting upstream more salinity intrusion is coming towards the mainland so the vegetation is also changing the plantation itself is getting changed so if you want to protect the mangrove we protect the ecosystem of the mangrove and that is the first thing you need to do you, i'm very very appreciative that you told that you cannot plant forest forest is generated it comes from the nature so you just leave it itself after cedar you know like there was lot of debates whether you should take the logs away from the sundarbans or whether you remove the wildlife that were actually killed there from the, from by the cyclone but the experts were very much you know like debating each other what to do and later bangladesh government took the decision to follow the nature one expert or some experts are telling oh let the nature be like that and it will heal itself and it is happening it happened when you are living it the nature itself comes with its own characteristic and that is the ecosystem itself so first of all we need to understand we cannot step ganges and brahmaputra along with magna i mean like borak to go to the bay of bengal we need to understand it we cannot stop it to go there so you need to live with that first thing is that and you need to keep the nature it you want to exist there otherwise it's a question of existence so first thing everybody can do what you try to develop your homestead like township plan everything did they you know like respecting or or be based on the natural ecosystem and then you develop yourself it, you can tell it like open approach you like keep the opening because rhine delta bengal delta and every delta has diff- unique characteristic rhine delta and bengal delta are two different worlds you know like the amount of silt it's carrying and the way it is the uh, sedimentation carrying from the upstream to the uh, sea itself so it's different i think everybody should first understand the importance of the sundarbans some bit of people think like it's just merely a forest some people think like it's merely 
a rare habitat of Bengal tiger or some species, but it's not it's actually protecting your land, your territory and your existence. So protecting Sundarbans is first for Bangladesh, it's not for climate change, it's for the natural existence, you need to protect it. And if you want to protect it, you identify the threats and you just uh, try to contribute to uh, come across the threats we have. Thank absolutely you so right, sir. Absolutely right. The lakes in the cities uh, would come under the limnology uh, aspect of the marine ecosystem. And uh, the oil, of course, if you study the, uh, you know... Uh, I can mention uh, more things. Two things. If, yes, you know, like, if you think about the Magna Estuary, it takes actually Ganges, Brahmaputra and Barak. So it's a huge amount of water and sediment. It come, goes to the Bay of Bengal, and then it has a hydrology itself. It's not like where it wants it goes. Yes. It has a hydrology. And it goes yes. towards the marine ecosystem of Bay of Bengal, which is very unique. Because if you see the swatch of Nograun, it's just close to the Sundarbans. And still, the Bengal fan, if you think about 12 million, I mean, like, uh, 12 crore, which will be 120 million years ago, when Gondwana was together and split the Indian plate and started north, north toward the north journey, it actually was uh, coming towards this way and creating Bengal fan. Bengal fan is still the largest sub aqueous sediment storage. So that part of the marine ecosystem is very unique and different. And that's why you find Irabuti dolphin there. They'll find you mammals there. You will find lots of different, very rare species very close to that coast. So that, and 25% of the uh, fish production for this entire country comes from the coast. So it's like not necessarily commercially important in terms of shipping and commerce and trade, it's important for many other things which are basic for survival. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Bhavesh, I leave it to you for the next question and the closing note. Thank you so very much, esteemed speakers, for enlightening us today, as shared by you and shared by the nature itself. Mangroves are not only our first line of defense, but our life savior in the long run as well. Almost one third of world population is depending upon mangroves for their survival. Their own survival depend on mangroves. We need to protect them. We need to take care of them. Then only we can think of a better ocean economy in times to come. Esteemed participants, your certificates, your, your presentations would be on your way by tomorrow. And uh, many thanks for joining us. And special thanks to all our speakers, Mr. Sharif, Mr. Shamim, Mr. Aditya Pundir, Elsie, Sumaya Ji, for joining us from the length and breadth of South Asia to make this program a success. We look forward to more active collaboration with you and the participants out here to do some concrete work on the ground. And a special thanks to Ria for coordinating it all. With this, we call it a day. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, Bhavesh. Thank you so much, Ria. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much and good night. We'll be in touch. Bye. Thank you. Thank yes, sir. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank, Thank you, much. everybody. Happy Thank you so much, Mr. Shami. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much, Sumaya.